The U.S. at Beijing has used billions of dollars to manipulate global media. Booming trade between China and Russia, shipping containers are piling up. Beijing requested foreign consulates in Hong Kong to share staff's personal information. Japan's nuclear wastewater discharge, Beijing's deception exposed once again. Whether or not Xi Jinping attends APEC depends on the Russia-Ukraine war situation, expert. On September 27th, in a report, the U.S. State Department said that Beijing is manipulating global media through censorship, data harvesting, and covert purchases of foreign news outlets. According to the report, the Chinese regime has spent billions of dollars annually on manipulating information to influence abroad. Beijing's forms of information manipulation include buying stakes in foreign media, sponsoring online influencers, securing distribution agreements that do not label China. The report says Beijing uses false or biased information to promote positive views of the PRC, People's Republic of China, and the Chinese Communist Party. The report added, at the same time, the PRC suppresses critical information that contradicts its desired stories on issues such as Taiwan, its human rights practices, the South China Sea, its domestic economy, and international economic engagement. The U.S. State Department report adds that Beijing has created its information ecosystem by attracting political elites and foreign journalists. It has also invested in developing region satellite networks and digital TV services, prioritizing Chinese state-backed media content. The report said Chinese data harvesting overseas has enabled Beijing to fine-tune global censorship by targeting specific individuals and organizations. Unchecked, Beijing's efforts could result in a sharp contradiction of global freedom of expression. The report produced under a congressional mandate said that regardless of unprecedented resources dedicated to global information manipulation in democratic countries, the Chinese regime has faced major setbacks because of local media and civil society pushback. According to Reuters, the Chinese embassy in the U.S. did not immediately respond to a request for comment on the report. According to a recent report, shipping containers from China are piling up in Russia as trade between the nations surges. Bloomberg reported that Russia has 150,000 excess shipping containers that importers are scrambling to return to China. These findings were released on September 28th by a Hamburg, Germany-based logistics platform, Container Exchange. Christian Roloffs, co-founder and CEO of Container Exchange, said in the report, There is significant cargo movement from China into Russia, but very scarce movement back to China from Russia. Containers are piling up in Russia, which means that the second-hand container prices are very low in Russia. He added that this has a tremendously detrimental impact on the business of container logistics because of the high imbalance of demand and supply. According to Container Exchange, the container glut results from the deepening trade imbalance between Russia and China regarding the types of goods the container carries. As a result, Russia's secondary container market experiences a decline where prices are less than half of what they are globally. The price of 40-foot high-cube containers, those with somewhat greater capacity than a regular 40-foot box, has dropped to $580 from $4,175 in February 2022. Regarding new containers, the price has decreased from $1,450 from $4,309 before Russia's invasion of Ukraine. According to Chinese customs figures released earlier this month, bilateral commerce increased by 32% in the first eight months of 2023, compared to the same period in the previous year, with a total trade volume of $155 billion. Even though it has been enduring sanctions from Western countries since Russia invaded Ukraine, Moscow expects trade volume with China to reach $200 billion this year. However, Container Exchange also highlighted other problems related to logistical issues amid booming trade between the two nations, saying, Overloaded Russian ports and roads are causing transportation inefficiencies. Although some investments have been made to improve infrastructure, fiscal constraints, and methods used to cover budget shortfalls complicate matters. It added, Russia's pivot to Asia hinges on substantial infrastructure development. The Chinese government recently mandated that foreign consulates in Hong Kong must provide personal details of their locally employed staff within one month. They also made it compulsory for new employees to complete a form within 15 days of starting their position. This requirement includes providing copies of personal documents without explaining the purpose. 
If a consulate terminates its employment relationship with local staff, it must inform the Hong Kong government's protocol division within 15 days. Former British consulate employee, unprecedented approach, local staff may become diplomatic pawns. Former British consulate employee Chang Wenji expressed concerns about local staff potentially becoming pawns in diplomatic disputes due to the Chinese Communist Party's mistrust of external forces. He noted that this level of scrutiny is unprecedented, extending even to local staff, unlike before 2019 when Beijing primarily focused on exempting diplomats from diplomatic duties and registering family members visiting Hong Kong. Last year, Beijing twice demanded foreign representative offices. Last year, Beijing twice demanded foreign representative offices in Hong Kong to provide information such as floor plans and staff residences, raising fears of potential surveillance device installation. This latest demand from China targets information about Hong Kong employees at foreign consulates. Chang believes this trend is alarming, progressing from disclosing foreign diplomats' floor plans and work-slash-live locations to the current scrutiny of existing staff. It's clear that Beijing wants this information voluntarily disclosed by those below, likely to save time and access loyalty. Beijing's actions eroded foreign trust in Hong Kong. International relations scholar Huang Weiguo sees this demand as unusual, possibly importing Chinese practices into Hong Kong. He considers it a hostile act towards foreign governments, further damaging international trust in Hong Kong. Foreign companies are increasingly withdrawing from Hong Kong, and the U.S. government has issued travel warnings, implying personal responsibility for any issues in China or Hong Kong. These subtle diplomatic moves suggest Hong Kong's evolving role in one country, two systems. Chung Wenji also believes that Beijing's enhanced surveillance approach worries local staff and discourages foreign personnel from working and developing in Hong Kong. This threatens Hong Kong's image as an international city and disrupts its role as a bridge between China and foreign nations. One month after China's ban on importing Japanese seafood expired, Chinese and Japanese fishing vessels continue to operate in the seas. However, seafood caught by Japanese fishing vessels is considered a prohibited import into China. In contrast, seafood harvested by Chinese ships in the same area as Japan but unloaded in Chinese ports can circulate freely within China. Japanese media have relied on data provided by the international nonprofit organization Global Fisheries Watch, GFW, to track the automatic identification system, AIS, signals on ship, monitoring the vessel's positions and activities while investigating the situation of Chinese fishing vessels in the North Pacific. According to the system, many Chinese fishing vessels have appeared in offshore waters about 620 miles, 1,000 kilometers east of Nimuro City, Hokkaido, a fishing ground for catching swordfish, tuna, saori, and other fish species. On August 3rd, there were 156 Chinese fishing vessels in the area. By September 19th, there were 162. Before and after the Chinese regime criticized Japan's Fukushima plan for discharging nuclear wastewater into the sea on August 24th, the number of Chinese fishing vessels in this area remained almost unchanged, fluctuating between 146 and 167 per day. Some offshore fishing companies in China interviewed by Japanese media admitted to continuing to catch swordfish and other fish species in this area in September. Furthermore, Park Gu Yuan, the first director of the South Korean State Department, pointed out during a regular press conference on September 25th that after Korean experts visited Japan for a second time to inspect the disposal site and the primary discharge equipment for the treated nuclear-contaminated water at the Fukushima plant, they did not find anything unusual. Meanwhile, Beijing strongly opposes this seawater discharge operation, maintains the ban on Japanese seafood imports, and adversely affects the local fishing industry. After Chinese President Xi Jinping attended the BRIC summit held in South Africa, he missed the G20 summit held in India and the United Nations General Assembly that just ended on September 26th. Therefore, many variables remain whether Xi Jinping will attend the Asia-Pacific Economic Cooperation, APEC, summit held in San Francisco from November 11th to 17th this year. At a press conference of the Chinese State Council on September 26th, when asked who would represent China at APEC, Chinese Foreign Minister Wang Yi replied, We are maintaining contact with all parties and will officially announce it at the appropriate time. Wang did not confirm whether Xi Jinping would attend the APEC summit.
Regarding this, senior political commentator Lan Xu said whether Xi Jinping attends or not depends largely on a comprehensive assessment of the Russia-Ukraine war situation. Because the Chinese government is not willing to see Russia defeated by the West, to ensure Russia is not defeated, because the Chinese government is not willing to see Russia defeated by the West, to ensure Russia is not defeated, the Chinese government needs to gain maximum access to investment, technology, and markets from the West. Xi Jinping must consider such circumstances. Lan Xu pointed out, Wang Yi just visited Moscow and Putin will visit Beijing next month to attend the Belt and Road Summit. Xi Jinping had the opportunity to learn about the Russia-Ukraine war situation. If Russia is going to lose this on the battlefield, it will need greater support from China. The Beijing government must publicly stand up to support Russia. Therefore, Xi may not come to the APEC. When China provides Russia with some of the things it needs in the supply chain so that Russia can fend for itself, then Xi may come to APEC. After all, he still wants to get a lot of high technology from the U.S. Russia has at least two months to prepare weapons before winter comes and faces a counterattack from Ukraine. Undoubtedly, as long as Xi Jinping provides aid to Russia, he and Biden will not be able to have a discussion even if they meet. And when he goes to the United Nations, he will be condemned by many countries. So he won't go. If you're about to be scolded, find someone else to take the scolding instead. Li Yuanhua, a scholar in Australia, believes Xi Jinping's attendance at the APEC summit is highly variable, mainly because of domestic security issues. On the surface, the Chinese government is determined to follow the orders of the highest-ranking people. But looking at recent changes in the PLA, four out of seven people in the military commission are now having problems. Xi's way of managing the military has changed a lot. The PLA is dissatisfied with him. He's aggravated everyone. The newly promoted people may be obedient on the outside, but disobedient on the inside to him. The internal security risks in China are considerable, directly affecting Xi's ability to go abroad. Furthermore, the domestic economy is weakening. He always wants to improve relations with the U.S. and hopes the U.S. blockade on China will be reduced or some parts of it will be lifted, but the U.S. may not be able to agree to it. So this will affect whether he can go or not.